Welcome to Cast Adrift, a behind-the-scenes podcast of the Sojourn audio drama where we have discussions with cast and crew and answer your questions about the show. Every episode of Cast Adrift is available for free on YouTube, and you can subscribe by, you know, clicking that little doobly-doo down below and click the bell because that's what we do now. I'm Larissa Thompson, the associate producer and the voice of Captain Cassandra Farron. We're talking with show creator Daniel Oritz and sound designer Kennedy Phillips. How are you guys doing? Hello, I'm doing well. I find myself floating in the middle of space, wondering how it is that we can make sound in it. <laughs> Ooh, asking the big questions. Solid stars. <laughs> Yeah, so today we're going to be discussing what Kennedy's approach to sound design for the show is and if there's any special thing that special things that he's done to help bring the sojourn alive into your eardrums. Uh, just so you know, this is going to be spoilers for volume 1, so if you haven't listened to the show yet, I mean, why are you we'll- here? <laughs> You've chosen you've chosen a very strange sequence in which to enjoy our content. <laughs> <laughs> But if for some strange reason you haven't listened to Volume 1, you can find some links to some retailers in the description, including Audible, Google Play, and Scribed, and a whole bunch of other platforms. Um, There might be the possibility that we're coming to libraries soon, which means that you can listen to The Sojourn for free in the near future. We'll be able to post news once we have it. So also make sure to follow us on Twitter so, so that you know when we can do that. So let's jump into it, right? Let's get into the meat. Let's figure out how how sound works. How does sound work? Well, I would say if we're going to be getting into it, we'd have to get into the protein blocks because we're in a terrible state of affairs in the food department over here in the Tantalus cluster. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. No kidding. Okay, but serious question now. What is the very first thing that you do to begin building your sound landscape for a scene like what do you do obviously what i end up doing is i have to listen to the whole thing first because when you when you're reading a script for an audio drama there's only so much that you can project in your head of what you want to do but a lot of times getting the performances can help me paint the picture of how the scene is going to be portrayed now when it comes to sound design you have to think very critically about every little detail that may come up that you would have visually. Now, from a movie standpoint or a cartoon or anything like that, you you have all the visual information presented to you, but in audio dramas, so much of that has to be constructed uh, in your own theater of the mind, as uh, Casey Wayland once cited it. Uh, He was a, a guiding presence for me when I started developing my, my audio drama, uh, chop, uh, chops a lot more. Let's say you're on the Guinevere and the sick bay in that place is, is very small. Cause there's like what one bed, two beds at most. Um, I used to grow, I, I lived on a sailboat when I was a kid. And one of the things that I remembered about that was that everything is tied down because the boat's rocking back and forth and anything that isn't properly secured is going to get knocked onto the floor and scattered and you'll step on it and make a mess at some point or another. Um, so you have to ask the questions like, what kind of ship are you dealing with? Is it a large capital ship? Is it a space station? Is it a shuttle? And you work from there. Um, with the Guinevere, the sick bay has a lot of equipment for monitoring equipment, but it's also got a lot of like first aid kits and rattling like small portable packages that they have to like rip open and uh, deal with. Um it's not like an open space like uh, uh, Star Trek, where even their even their smaller capital ships uh, they have like this massive sick bay where there's like a lot of walking room for gurneys. I assume, despite that they have teleportation technology. <laughs> yeah, and I mean the the Guinevere's sick bay is really like a cupboard, like it's tiny, like it's it's one of the smallest smallest rooms on the ship. So that you you would have like a lot of rattling sounds if the ship is moving a lot uh, really fast, or uh, if any time a character has to open up something, like if Meds needs to get like some kind of syringe or something, she has to open up like three containers just to get to it. 
Yeah, I mean, the last thing you would want is a uh, weightless situation zero G where there's just syringes floating around. Oh God! It's like you know, anything anything becomes a projectile if you suddenly accelerate and it's not tied down on a spacecraft. It, it it's it's okay. Like if that, if that happens, you just pick up the patient and then move them around vigorously until the syringe hits its mark. <laughs> It's a it's a very dangerous kind of uh, medicine, but hey, some of the people that go on this endeavor are are daredevils at the best. <laughs> so, would you say that um, seeing a lot of uh, ship breakdowns and and layouts of the ship actually really helped you design what a, a particular space on a ship would sound like? Yeah, actually, um, mostly because when I'm sound designing the Guinevere in particular, I'm, I'm using I'm going to use the Gwen a lot because it's the one that I have the clearest understanding of where everything is. And also, um, she pretty. She is. You're you're not just dealing with whatever is in the room. You're also dealing with um, navigation and how how characters are moving around in the in the ship and where other things are in relation to the ship. Uh, again, I go back to the, the sailboat thing cause I have a lot of experience with it. When you're in the bow of the ship and the engine is going, you're still hearing the engine. The engine is not, is not protected by too many layers of, uh, walls to diffuse that sound. So wherever you are in the Guinevere, you hear the engine going on some level. There's also like, uh, there's no medium to, uh, to, for the sound to be reverberated through. So it is just the ship. Like a ship is a giant bell being rung at all times, basically. You, you're definitely going to hear this all, all wherever you are on board because it's just reverberating through the whole ship. Yeah, you're, you're, hearing, you're hearing the engines, you're hearing life support, you're hearing somebody cooking downstairs if there's some kind of plumbing going on. The, the idea is that you are always aware of what's happening in the back of the ship even when you're in the front of the ship. Not to mention the way that a character walks around, like say if they want to go from uh, aft port to bow starboard, they're they're climbing through ladders, they're crawling through vents, they're doing all sorts of things to, to navigate there. It's not just a straight walk. I try very hard to maintain the time it takes to walk between these because uh, if a character is, say, in the kitchen... And or in the mess in the galley and walks up stairs to uh, the bridge, you're hearing them climbing up a ladder. You're hearing them walking down a hall, and that all that time they can have conversations and the like. Okay, so um, walk us through the life cycle of an episode. Like, what were all of the steps that you had to take for, let's say, episode three, yesterday's war? So when you got the raw recordings from the actors, uh, what would happen to make that episode come alive? Well, the first thing that I would have to do is I'd have to space out the the voices because a lot of times when we when we first started out doing the assemblies, um, I would get the the dialogue right at one after the other, and I'd have to cut them up, split them up, and and paste them how I want them to. There's a kind of an unconscious rhythm that everybody has when they're trying to visualize something from audio, and you immediately know when it when it's off when it's not working properly case in point, when you walk into say, say star Wars, you're watching a scene of all the, the soldiers uh, milling about in the empire's uh, docking bay, uh, getting into the hangar to prep, to get on the ships. You hear the ambience, you hear people walking around, you see people like saluting or getting ready for things. You, you get a moment to immerse yourself in that zone before things start going. What I usually like to do first when I'm sound designing one of these is I like to build the atmosphere of the location first. Um, this would be things like engines or background noise or wall of, of characters milling about doing things. Something that gives you the sense that you've created the set in your head before you have any action going on. Then I start thinking about what are each of the characters doing? So, uh, say on the, the Avalon, the shuttle bay, um, I start working on the foreground where you're dealing with, um, a different pressure doors that, that open and close and you kind of have to treat it like a, a diving tank where you have to depressurize before you, you move out. Um, so the sound of 
the ship passing through to that sector, you hear like this big brown of just the ship passing through it. Um, before the, you know, the doors end up, uh, closing off and you hear maybe like chimes of, okay, uh, the room is clear time to move a big detail that I like to put in every scene is for the, the computers to actually communicate what's happening. So if you're paying enough, close enough attention, you'll hear a chime of, hangar bay clear to, to move on to the next one or an alert when something's about to go for a jump or even if there's like a proximity alert. I remember you actually added, uh, the shuttle, uh, had like an announcement saying, uh, stand clear doors closing in the background, which was a cool little detail. I like, I like that you added that. Yeah. Cause in, in those kinds of, uh, bays, uh, having like not paying attention is a death sentence. So having people just say these things out loud, even as silly as that may seem, it can be very important for somebody who might not be paying attention. Like if they hear a chime and they just kind of tune it out, that that's harder to, that's easier to do than say, attention, please. Doors are closing automatically. One, uh, one thing that's quite uh, abusing is that like military science fiction lends itself really well to audio drama format because people in the military do just tell everybody what's happening in excruciating detail all the time. Like everyone's just narrating everything they're doing and it's completely normal. So it's like fits the, the format really well because there's no reason why you can't say like, I'm, I'm moving to this position or whatever because it's just the way they, they operate. It's not like uh, unusual to start hearing that kind of thing. Yeah, communication's incredibly important in, in audio dramas and in, in military because... Um... So often we take for granted the visual cues that we're given when we're looking at something, what may seem unnatural in like a, a movie is something that you don't even really think about in audio dramas because it helps you understand what's happening now. Uh, again, uh, case in point, say you walk up to a door and you need to open it, uh, in a military setting, they'll probably give an order. It's like, oh, go open up this door. It's like, right, let me get this. Uh, right now in a visual thing, maybe they don't even say anything. They just look at it and they just op uh, work on opening the door. Um, but if it's, if it's something complicated, that's about to happen, like say, let's say Croft needs to de uh, demagnetize a door to, to open it up or something, you'll hear like a thunk and then him pull, pulling a lever to, to, to secure the, the vacuum before they pull it open or something along the lines of that. So you could say that you start with the the general ambience of the of the whole room really rooting uh rooting the audience in a location and then you move on to like the actual the character action to to make that full yeah i i have it in three stages i i start with the big the the macro where it's the the big scene the the ambience the the environment um i start i then go to the um minutia of the Foley, like footsteps and clothing rustle and other things like that. And then I save my favorite part for last, which is the design work. Ooh, tell us more. Most of the design work uh, in, in Sojourn is a combination of my own Foley with uh, library sounds that I found all over the world. Uh, this, this, these range from like somebody playing around with a synthesizer to whale noises and otherwise that I have integrated into the design of a, of, of the ship or otherwise. One of my favorite designs that I got to toy around with was the, the alien cutting beam. Mariana, take a base of action. Um, I called it the, I called it the cutter at the time and I had to break down every piece of this to figure out what qualities and textures I wanted to present to the audience for what it would sound like. When you think about a sound effect, you're thinking about it as a single 
uh, as, as a singular thing, but it's not. When you're doing design, it's a combination of anywhere between two to three to dozens of different sounds when it comes to textures. So what quality do you want to have for it? Well, let's, let's break down the, let's break down this alien cutter. I kind of consider a lot of my sound effects very much like how you would describe constructing a sandwich. There are, they're the basic things, the, the bed, the, the bread that is the dominant sound within it, but there's also sweeteners like, um, higher pitched things. There's lower vibration. There's other qualities going on within it that tell its own story. Um, for the cutter, you have that charge up sound that is supposed to be not only, not only sounds powerful, but it's psychologically terrifying. Like it's, it's psychologically damaging to listen to it. So I looked up a bunch of different sounds that would be unsettling for a person to listen to the kind of sounds that you think about and you just get like the shivers without thinking about it. Uh, things like cats yowling or nails on a chalkboard or um, so on and so forth. The reason why I needed it. Well, the, the important thing about it though, is that you need to find something that's grating and unpleasant and unsettling, but isn't painful to listen to. I, I always have to balance discomfort with listenability because there's so many times when I'm listening to like a movie or something and they do that high pitched squeal that is supposed to be on, uh, something that only dogs hear, but it's incredibly painful to listen to. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I hate doing that. I hate doing that. So I integrated the sound of a baby crying and stretched and warped it as part of the charge up to the sound. Interesting. Normally that's something like that immediately triggers an adrenaline response in most people when they hear a baby crying. Like the the instinctive response is I need to I need to take care of this baby. But to then twist it and morph it into this like threatening monstrous thing, like that's that's really cool. Because what I'm distilling from that sound of the baby crying is not like a sense of I need to is is specifically a sound of urgency. Mm. But it's also like an unpleasant noise because there's a lot of people out there that will associate a baby crying with unpleasant memories. <laughs> and having that as like a charge up for a laser is a great way to uh, ha develop a, a I, I think the word is light motif. Is it just motif? Yeah, like so, well, it's a it's a it's a light motif for 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 the sound design is something that say Cass now has like rattling around in her head is just the sound of that is now associated with complete tragedy that she may or may not feel responsible for, and then uh, of course you know at the end of that you have the the sudden rush of the blast going out usually like I'll, I'll maybe mix a couple of like uh air pockets blasting or maybe like a tiny explosion and then the the constant steady beam hitting against the ship and you could hear it like cutting into the hull ripping it apart and the i added a little bit of flange to it because it's as as the ship is moving in its angle uh, your perspective on the beam is changing. Consider this. When you're at a beach, um, if you cup your hands over your ears and you move around your hands, the sound changes and adjusts because of your perspective. So if, say, this cutting beam is moving across this ship, your perspective is moving a little bit too. So creating the Doppler effect falsely it's it's a combination of doppler and flange okay because uh doppler is in terms of physical orientation like spatial orientation of of where it's coming from but uh flange is how the frequency is being affected um oh. so when you move from let's say like you cut out okay a, a good example is um when you're listening to something from the other side of a door. You're only hearing the very low end of the vibration passing through the door. The mids and highs are, are almost completely uh, eliminated. 
Now say, take that, that low feeling and you move it so that you're only hearing the mids, then you're only hearing the upper, upper region. Then you're only hearing the very high moving between that, like moving back and forth on that is called flange. Oh, interesting. So it's like, wow. I know that's a weird sound to make for that kind of thing, but it's. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a really effective demonstration. Yeah. Huh. Um, and you could use flange for a lot of different things. Like, um, ah, here's a great example. Um, any of you guys ever play Halo back in the day? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, do you remember the voice of 343 Guilty Spark, the little drone that, uh, controls the station of Halo? Mm-hmm. Unacceptable. Unacceptable. <laughs> Absolutely unacceptable. The only real thing that's on his voice is just a flange. It's, it's slowly going up and down of adjusting his pitch to a mm. flange. That way, so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cool. Okay, so then after you've gotten like the really fun, interesting, like custom design work done, what's then? Are you like, is it all packaged up and ready to go, or is there another step? Well, the the other step obviously is the mixing, but uh, that that's a completely different beast. I can tell you that much. Um, <laughs> what I will say though is. One of the things that I do with uh, the Sojourn team is I will make a first cut and then I'll send it to them. And there's a lot of times where my sound design is not what they're looking for. Um, a particular sound effect or design of something that just doesn't doesn't feel quite right. Like uh, one, one case in particular uh, that ended up getting severely cut back was the coffee maker. <laughs> I knew this was coming. <laughs> the... I, at one point, uh, I, I was, uh, working on a scene where, uh, uh, Cass and, uh, Elizabeth are just, are talking over, over some, having some coffee and something clicked in my head where I was assaulted with every compounded memory of my parents making espresso every day for 20 years. <laughs> So I, I developed an almost muscle memory of every single process that happens when a coffee machine is doing its thing. And I wanted to recreate that because there's, there's a, there's a nostalgic comfort to that. I don't drink coffee, but I find the sound of a coffee machine to be very soothing. Even if, if it's just branch, branch, wow, 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 wow. <laughs> I, f I, I felt bad having to murder this thing you'd created. It was, it, was well, like, it was like a 30, it was like a 30 second procedure. It was so long. And you, you, you told me, is there a reason why this needs to be 30 seconds long? I go, yeah, you asked for realism. Sounded like some sounded like some kind of super weapon. <laughs> What's like, going on? I, mean, I was like, I, I'd gone into that scene assuming that what we would get is like a beep and then a bit of liquid noise, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, but like you, you, you had told me, you told me, you told me, you made a point of this. Like, I, I really don't want a replicator in this scene. I want to make that perfectly clear. We are not Star Trek. You can do this. I'm like, yes, I can. I, I will make a more industrial coffee maker. And then you and then you come back and she's like, hmm, perhaps there's such thing as too real. <laughs> yeah, perhaps. <laughs> but hey, now you've got a really, really elaborate coffee maker in your library. <laughs> yeah, and it's, uh, it's on Twitter if you guys want to find it. The full beast of the coffee machine. Was tweeted at one point. Sounds like a JCB. You can find it. <laughs> but yeah, there, there's there's a lot of times when like I'll get the I'll get some of the sound design off. Like it's not quite 
visually what you want to imagine. But there's also times when I'm trying to essentially pull a magic trick where I'm trying to get, I'm trying to convince you that the sound of me slapping a metal pipe against, uh, a, another metal pipe is the sound of somebody climbing a ladder. Cause I don't have a ladder at home that is of the same thickness and durability as the ones on the Guinevere. I have ladders at home, but they sound like they're made of aluminum and plastic. And that's not what it sounds like on the Guinevere. I remember you, uh, used like a sliver of a piece of stock sound effect that was supposed to be like a, an ax like a like a a slow animal, like a chicken uh, being killed with an axe or something, and you used it to make uh, the metal cups on the on the Guinevere <laughs> that they drink the tea out of. <laughs> it's like what uh, you did it in like in like half a second. <laughs> we were like we were on a screen share and you just did it. I was like, what was that? Was that an axe? <laughs> okay. Yeah, like you heard me like doing an axe chop, and you're like, I- I'm sorry. How is that going to translate to? And then you just see me pull, go into surgery, and I'm cutting down like like milliseconds of of this of this sound, and then splicing it into another sound entirely. And you're like, that sounds perfect. What did you do? How- are you a wizard? I don't. <laughs> you're very fast at that. It is crazy. Well, like one one thing that I I, I do a lot with some of my sound design is that. I have I have eight terabytes of sound effects. Oh my lord! Wow! A not insignificant amount of them are farts. <laughs> uh, but the problem is that a lot of these sounds uh, they they've got background noise or they've got part of what I'm looking for, but not all of it. Like say, um, all right here here's an, here's an example. I'm gonna I'm gonna segue to another project that I worked on just as an example. Um, I'm I'm also the sound designer in a couple of animations such as uh, Hell of a Boss and Has Been Hotel. And one of the characters has these really sharp high heel boots. And in the back of my head, I said, yo, what if her high heels were knives? And I'm like, well, that's ridiculous. I don't have any knives that sound like high heels. If I take the sound of a knife hitting concrete, only take the very beginning part of it, like the, the attack or the, the sound of the, the, the part of the sound that is the beginning of the vibration impact. and the, the impact and splice that in with the tail end of a high heel and mix them together. Then it sounds like a knife high heel boot. Now I want you to imagine that thought process for every single sound effect that has any kind of design quality in this show. <laughs> You don't. You found yourself in a weird career when you get to say things like, "I don't have any knives that sound like high heels." <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, do you ever use your own mouth to make foley? All the time. Yeah. What's What's Absolutely been your favorite? All the time. Like, have you done it for the Sojourn? And what sound effect was just your your face? Um. Well, obviously, a lot of the ones that were involving chewing, like anytime that they're. Uh, Probably, probably my favorite one was, uh, uh, I think there's a point where a character touches a protein block with this, with their bare finger and they're like just poking at it. And it's like, uh, and I, I just ended up making a sound like to make it like the most unappetizing sounding thing out there. Just, (laughs) (laughs) um, but I've, I've also used, um, mouth sounds for other things. Like I've digitized, uh, mouth clicks, like. Or um, make like little clicking sounds and then use a vocoder to make it sound like a computer beep for like a door opening or other things like that. Um, uh, Like one that I did in episode one is right before Med says they struck their colors. There's a little boop. And that's just me going boodle doop and then (laughs) adding like some vocoder to it. That's cool. It's convincing. That's really cool. I don't know whether it's you should really be. Convincing. I don't know whether you should be telling people this stuff because it's so convincing. The mysteries being shattered. Oh yeah, or like um, one sound that I did was like somebody managing like uh, Daniel. You'd express wanting to have a more analog feel to a lot of the cranks and levers and beeps and boops and stuff on the ship. Um, so one that I like doing was uh, I got to move close to the microphone for this one where it's. It's just me taking my tongue and pressing it up against my lower lip and it makes this little popping noise. Is that noise. the throttle? When I asked you to change the throttle and, and we ended up with that 
like because I think that sounds really cool. The throttle that we've got now on the Gwim. It's got the uh, yeah. The that, that's like, it. That that's just that sound pitched down oh and then add a little bit of reverb to. <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah, that's great stuff because it's got that kind of like uh, it's like a uh, crank, like a kind of like it's uh, like it's got this great. Yeah, I mean, I could do cr I could use a crank, but I, I wanted to try that one to see how it would feel, and it it sounds more unique that way because a, a lot of my I would describe a lot of my sound design as the right degree of jank. <laughs> it's <laughs> jank and that's, that's really what you could describe a lot of, of like the Guinevere itself is that it's this high tech ship that is patched together with a little bit of jank. Yeah. <laughs> Di diet jank. <laughs> diet jank. Oh my God. What was the hardest element that you've had to design? What did you struggle with the most? Every single ship in the show has its own feel to it, their own texture, their own signature that you can recognize just by listening to it. For example, the Avalon has the habitation ring. Uh, the Guinevere has its own series of beeps and boops and their, their, their afterburners uh, and uh, engines sound very particular compared to some of the other ships. Uh, same thing with the alien ships. But I would say the... The Driftgate was one of the harder ones because I wanted to find a way to make it sound unique in its own way without sounding like the Mass Effect uh, warp gate. Mass Relay. That they have. The Mass Relay. Thank you. I, I wanted to make sure that I didn't make it just sound like another warp, uh, another Mass Relay. So I had to sit down and and look through all of the, the ship pass by sounds, the hit sounds and everything to find the right tone that I wanted to give. I wanted it to sound adventurous, but also kind of jank. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cause there's this one part in the first episode where all the ships all go to warp at once. They all, they all go off and, and you hear like the sound of a bunch of ships going off all together. Um, and I must've gone through like four or five iterations before I was really satisfied. And it's funny because every time I went through an iteration, I just kept saying to myself more, just add more. Don't remove things. Just add more to it. <laughs> there was a point when I presented that to you, uh, to, to uh, Daniel. And he's like, that's perfect. This is great. I, I love this. Do, do nothing to it. And I'm like, all right. And then I get to the mix stage and I b almost blast out my hearing because of how loud it was in the 5.1 mixing room. <laughs> yeah, it was like, uh, that was definitely the the main set of notes for the drift gate was like, now make it louder. Now make it louder again. More, more not louder. <laughs> yeah. and, th and then I get to the mix room and I, and I flashbang myself. <laughs> cool. So I'm going to move on to some fan questions now. Um, you actually already answered one of these, but I'm going to read it out and then we can just like, kind of relive that moment um, so that, yeah, we can just relive it. Or I could just tell a different version of that answer. Yeah, I can also do that. Screeb asked, what's your favorite moment from the Sojourn sound? Screeb asked, what's your favorite moment of the Sojourn from the sound designed? Oh my God. Do I speak for a living? No. <laughs> Screeb asked, what's your favorite moment of the Sojourn from the sound design side of things so far? Okay. Um, I got two. I got two that are my favorite. In every single episode, there is one moment where all the dialogue is put aside and you just get a chance to feel the space. I love building those because the sound design becomes its own character and allows you to immerse yourself in the moment. Um, in episode one, it's when they the ship goes to warp and comes back in the middle of an ice field and you're just hearing like asteroids buffeting against the hull um in episode two it's when uh they go into the gate hauler and they actually like cut open the door and and you know move the door open and they just float into this empty space oh, i love that and you could feel that emptiness just kind of echo where they're like scanning for life signs and other things. And, and you get the mag, not... the mag boots like one by one touching down. Yeah, that was really, really well paced. 
Yeah, like it's it's there's it's such a small moment, but I intentionally gave a lot of space for it because I wanted the audience to feel that space and and slowly piece together the scene in their head before we started giving them the information of dialogue talking. Um, but one that I really loved in episode three, not a lot actually happens in episode three sound design wise, except for the big detonation at the end. Building that sound where you hear an explosion off in the distance and there's a, just a, a moment of silence where the alarms go quiet, where everything just stops. And in your head, you can just picture the light hitting you first and then the <laughs> followed by like this big vibration hitting against the, sh uh, the, the, the hull of the Avalon and making everything rumble where even like the gravity has been affected by this, by this detonation. Yeah. There's so much power. Oh, it's silence. such a good moment. There's so much power behind it. I've got to say, I, I love all of the little small things you do. Like there's uh in the, in the bar scene in three, like there's bits where you can hear like the kind of people slapping on each other's shoulders and putting their arms around each other and stuff and like punctuating, like, and it, it's always like at the right moment in the dialogue where it just feels like it just adds that little bit to the banter and it's just like really, really works. It's uh, yeah. It's I like, it's really hard to know the right moment to do those kinds of things because you don't want it to muddy the dialogue, but you also want it to feel full. So a lot of times what you end up having to do is you end up having to scoop out the foreground elements and then shift them into areas where nobody's talking so that you can still feel that full scene that it's busy and everything like that. But when people are talking, the cocktail party effect comes into play um, subjectively. Uh, for, for those of you that don't know, the cocktail party effect is the um, phenomena where your hearing tunes out unnecessary information to focus on somebody having a conversation or something that you're, you're focusing on. This is why when you're in a cocktail party, when you're talking to somebody, you can have a conversation with them and not hear 80 different conversations all going at once. So as a sound designer, I have to artificially create that effect for you to be able to understand what's happening. But without it sounding like you're just removing sound, like you still need to be able to imagine the sound even though it's not there. So instead of removing the sound, I'm turning it down or I'm, I'm rearranging it a little bit. Or heck, I'll, I'll go into the uh, waveform and algorithmically remove aspects of the waveform. <laughs> I'll like equalize it. So like only like you only hear the lower end of it or something like that during a particular scene. There's, there's so much magic. Uh, okay. Next question. Mucus drizzle asks, that's such a gross username. Charming <laughs> username. Well done. Mucus drizzle. Mucus drizzle <laughs> asks, how much do you and Sam collaborate to make the sound and music more cohesive? Hmm. There's a lot of times where I'll let Sam do his own thing, but f uh, frankly, a lot of times what he'll do is he'll wait for me to completely finish my sound design and then work from there. But I love, I love collaborating with composers because I love being able to sound design in time with the music that's being presented as well. Um, sometimes I'll get a song from one of my projects and they'll have like a very, very clear uh, metronome going with it, a very clear tempo. And I will adjust my sound design to play in favor of it. Other times what will happen is um, when I'm working on sound design, I'll talk to Sam and say, hey, I'm, I'm thinking of trying to get this feel for it or trying to get this other idea going on. Um, do you mind if I use some temp tracks or something to give you an idea of what I'm looking for? And he's like, yeah, sure. Um, and I'll, I'll pull things from like Mass Effect or Mech Warrior 2 or other sci-fi uh, uh, games or cartoons or something just for temp music. 
to, to show them like, okay, this is what I'm kind of going for, for a feel, or I'll describe to them what I'm looking for. And like, I'll give them links to like songs. And I say, I want the percussion on this. Can you get me that? And it'll be like, okay, sure. Fine. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Neat. Okay. Next question. Digital Sock asks, what's your balance between using a sound library and making use of sound design for the Sojourn? Which is also kind of a question that you asked earlier, but if you could give us a little summary. Yeah, um, I I make a lot of my own sound, but um, in terms of budgetary concerns, I can't rent out a Foley stage to do a lot of the sound design that I do here. So a lot of what I use is library, but the way that I use library is that I I intersplice it with my own recordings of props that I have in my office. Um, Cause I actually have a Foley kit here. I've got tons of books. I've got a synthesizer, a theremin, a kalimba and other uh, meditation bowl and other things like that, that I use to intermingle with what's going on in the scene. And I will take library sounds and then Frankenstein them to the point where I could potentially mark them as my own property at that point. <laughs> It's, it's kind of like um, one of my favorite artists on YouTube, Pogo. He'll actually take music um, by creating songs out of dialogue and sound effects from movies. But he'll splice it down to the syllable to the millisecond or, the, uh, or, the, uh, or, or, or by the frame and just take those portions and, and build them into their own instruments to the point where it's unrecognizable from what it originally was. And that's kind of what I do for a lot of my sound design stuff. But I mean, for, for, for people like walking around and things like that, I've got hundreds of footsteps, thousands of footsteps of different surfaces, different textures of boots and things like that. And I just, I'll, I'll throw them in and then like, I'll splice it or I'll, I'll mix it up or adjust it. So just, I want you to take a moment to appreciate that every single footstep in this, in this audio drama is manually placed there with full intention and, and, and thought. So everything down from like a scuff is something that I had to physically put there and say, would they be actually shuffling their feet at this point? <laughs> it all comes out in the end. Yeah, yeah. That kind of attention to detail, like you can hear it and it's so cool and yeah it it creates this really rich well-rounded e listening experience and i think that's kind of what's not to toot our own horns or anything but that's kind of what sets a sojourn apart from so many other audio dramas is it's it's treated with the same seriousness as a feature film as if the entire purpose of this video isn't to toot our own horn <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I, you, you say the seriousness of a film of a film production as somebody that has worked on a film production. I can tell you there are so many films that don't think about sound. Yeah, at all. it's it's a quickly forgotten department. But I will also say in the same breath of seriousness, at some point, Daniel, when are you going to let me make Croft uh, tap dance? <laughs> <laughs> I'll put it on the list. <laughs> if I if I get to make Croft tap dance, I'll be happy. Six seasons in a movie, and then you get Croft tap dancing, all right? <laughs> listen listen up, Patreon supporters. Get on it. Yep. It's going to happen, but only with your support. Uh, okay. Well, thank you so much for, for having a chat with us, Sarah Kennedy. This has been incredibly eye-opening. There's so many wonderful little details I had no idea about. It was really, really ear-opening. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for listening. This has been Cast Adrift, a behind-the-scenes podcast of the Sojourn audio drama where we have discussions with cast and crew and answer your questions. If you would like to have one of your questions answered in a future Cast Adrift episode, then join our Discord server. There's a link in the description. And you'll also get updates and announcements um, for the Sojourn show and Cast Adrift. And then you also get to meet other fans, which we've got a, a great community here. We really do. It's such a great community. Absolutely. We love it here. You can also follow The Sojourn on Twitter at The Sojourn HQ. You can also find more about Kennedy's stuff. We've got links for his stuff in the description, including his, his own Twitter. Um, make sure that you subscribe and click the bell so that you get notified when we publish more episodes of Cast Adrift and any other content upcoming. Uh, Smash that like button. <laughs> And don't forget to listen to The Sojourn, yes. book one, now available on Audible and wherever audiobooks are sold. Perfect yes. delivery.
Just going to put that everywhere. Fair winds. Fair winds. <laughs> Fair winds.